Hey guys, welcome to Standing in Faith. My name is Kat, and I'm in the studio with Jeff. Here I am. David. Hey. And we have another special guest today named Carol. Here. <laughs> in Mark, right after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to teach his disciples. And this is in Mark 8, starting at verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and he said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels." So, once again, we're embarking on an idea that includes a graphic image. So, for those of you that are listening to us on a video platform, you'll be able to see that graphic. For those of you who are listening to us on a podcast platform, in the description, I'll include a link that will take you to our blog site, and you can look up and and retrieve the graphic that we're going to be discussing. So today we're kind of starting an embarkation on something. I just made up a word. Embarkation. I like yeah. it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I'm feeling very creative today. <laughs> so we're, we're embarking on uh, an idea here that you've kind of read about, and that's life, death, and resurrection. Kind of flows out of where we just finished with Bill, but I think we need, I'd like to talk a, a, it through, and I know David has a wonderful way of walking us through this diagram that we're looking at. So, David, I'm going to kind of give it to you to start the conversation off on this idea. Well, <clears throat> in looking at, of course, if you're looking at the diagram... Um, there's, there's always a place in our life, whether we're, whether it's a dream vision, a calling or whatever it is that we receive, even when we become believers, that we begin to walk out our faith in our life. And it typically doesn't walk in a straight line. <laughs> it goes down. You know, I remember when I first became a believer, and, and, and it was during the hippie, re hippie, and I was a Jesus freak. And so we would tell other other guys, say, hey, yeah, get get off drugs and get high on Jesus. And they'd say, oh, yeah, so they'd get high on Jesus, but then they started this descent down. Mm. And, <laughs> and they went back to drugs because— they just wanted to really get high, you know. They, it, it, but the 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 idea is that God wants to mature us throughout our life. That's because maturity ultimately brings abundant life. It really, really does. And so we kind of take this down. We we take this. The road that God takes us on is life. Then there's a death to something, and then there's always a resurrection. In, in some capacity or other. And, you know, none of us like the death part. But if you look at the, if you look at what we had just done, and you can get those graphics too on, on our blog site, right? So in the very beginning, yeah, yeah. right, you, you, you find salvation or find, salvation finds you, right? That, yeah. That's a high point. Yeah. Right? And, it, and it produces what? It produces excitement, yeah. life. Joy. Yeah, I love new whether converts. Whether it's salvation, whether it's a, a call from mm -hmm. God to 
to to be a missionary, to be a pastor, to be an evangelist, to be yeah. right to to be serving him somehow, or even a vision of something that you can see that's right. Oh, I, I'm sup- I'm supposed to build a hospital this, hospitals all across my nation, right? That those are big, typically dreams, visions, callings, even salvation are big moments, mm-hmm. right? They're high points. Um, and I think the idea here is that's it, it starts off with this this life of wow, look at what just opened up before my eyes. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But before you get to the fulfillment of it, there's this big, deep, dark valley that you're probably gonna have to walk through. And if you don't, I question the, your maturity level in trying to reach what is the fulfillment that a lot of times people try to do uh, um, without going through the other part. And usually it ends in pretty much a mess. Well, yeah, after you've had this mountaintop experience, right, you're all jazzed up, mm-hmm. and then you start to walk or maybe even run towards that, and the next thing you know, whoa, 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 whoa right? I, I'm going to need to have some faith for this. Right, so that's I think that's what you're saying is kind of the downward slope is like all of a sudden, whoa, okay, there's more to this, right? It's just not shazam, there it is, right? I'm gonna have to walk this thing out, run this thing out, work this thing out, and that's requiring us to start to exercise our faith that this big, huge, wonderful, impossible thing that that's taking place in us, right, is gonna require us to. To work towards it mm-hmm. and mature and grow towards it. You know, when you consider that um, maturity is really the process that God has given uh, to bring seed from planting to harvest. And he did it from before the foundation of the world through his own son. Um, and when you consider he said it before everything it means that everything will follow that. And there's something of what you said originally, Kat, when you read that scripture. Maturing is a very natural process, but it's also a spiritual process. For those of faith and those who believe um, in Jesus Christ, it becomes a spiritual process uh, that goes much deeper and it has different purposes to it. The natural ones You don't even have to know the Lord, and you're still going to have to be matured socially. You're going to have to be Mm -hmm. matured in other ways to keep a job and to get along. You know, it has benefits uh, in that regard. But concerning faith, um, man's interests are not God's interests, bottom line, Mm -hmm. the way we see things. Mm -hmm. And the goal of anything is not the same either because ours is right here, right now. But yet when God starts something, he sees it from the beginning before the foundation, to the fulfillment of everything else. Um, And so we would look at it differently. Um, But if you consider the seed, like you're talking about, you know, that seed ultimately is Jesus Christ, and everything will be reconciled back to that seed. Mm -hmm. And also the process we look for is why would he um, incorporate that deep place, that dying place, that dark place, except that we have to enter that by faith. Because Paul says himself that there is no gospel without the resurrection from the dead. Mm -hmm. Everything's hinging on that. But you don't get to a resurrection without a death. That doesn't mean everybody dies physically, but we die daily in various ways and in various places for the benefit of something being brought to fruitfulness, something being brought to a higher value. So death is not the end of anything. For the, it's not for anybody, but more so for us who believe. So that process is something that is viewed from two different angles. That's why we fear death, because we're looking at it from a natural perspective. We don't fear death if we see it from a spiritual perspective. Mm -hmm. I think the idea of a seed is a good one, right? We already kind of discussed the the different types of ground. But ultimately, before you ever get to planting the seed, you need to plow the field, which is a lot of hard work, 
a lot of a lot of sweat equity goes into plowing. Um, just me personally, um, plowing is hard. <laughs> Harvesting is hard too, but it's fun. Plowing is hard and hard. Um, it's but you have to plow before you have to prepare the ground so that when you actually do get that seed in there. I think that's kind of the metaphor here is plowing is kind of like faith at this point. You got this wonderful revelation of what is possible or what could be for you. Then you need to start the preparations and you need to plow and you need to do it with faith, right? Ultimately leading us towards, um, in the diagram, the valley of the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. So if you think about the idea of seeds in the way that we talked about them earlier, right? The hard ground, the rocky ground, the thorns, and then the good soil. Um, as soon as you start talking, Jeff, I thought about that place in The, the Chosen. If you haven't seen The Chosen yet, it's a fantastic show. Um, it's in three seasons now, but in the first of the second season, it shows um, two of the disciples, and they were plowing up that ground. Of course, they were having to pull it, pull the plow themselves, you know, and it looked like a job, throwing rocks <laughs> out and cleaning yeah. all this stuff yeah. out of it. Uh, so that picture came to my mind when you were talking about how, it, you know, how tough that, that kind of, of work is plowing is exhausting yeah yeah especially if you're doing it by hand and not with a tractor yeah um so when we think about coming down begin to walk through this place of death that's what happens to a seed right when it's planted it dies and the only way it can of course grow is first that it dies um which is an interesting thought but it so it goes into the soil the interesting part about that is, which of the soils does it go into? And I think a lot of that plays into our life. What is it that we want when we begin this slope downwards? And, and if you read Philippians 2, you get a good idea of what Jesus, you know, though he was in the form of God, he didn't think being equal with God was something to cling to. He emptied himself. Um, became obedient even to the point of death, became a slave to, to the point of he was like a slave almost. That's how low he had lowered himself and died on a cross. And then it says, and then it goes seven steps up how God, you know, highly exalted him and put him at the right hand of God because he'll forever be God man. Um, anyway, you, <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, do I want to fall in that good soil? And what is that good soil? It takes to go through something like this is I think I think the dark places teach us humility. And I think the good soil is really willingness to learn humility. Mm -hmm. Because I think if we don't, then we may spend a long time in those places that 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 you can can then begin to deceive yourself about which can be not so great in luke 8 where it's talking about the the parable of the sowers and explaining it the the seed that fell on the good soil uh, is those that hear the word retain it and by persevering produce a crop so you have a, the hearing mm -hmm. the retaining mm -hmm. you're holding on to that and that's faith you're holding on to it and then there's the perseverance and that's what produces the crop. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So I I think part of getting passing through, right? I think that's a key here. We want to pass through the valley of the shadow of death. Mm -hmm. We don't want to we don't want to get there and think we've arrived, right? But I think it's a dark it's dark place. It's shadowy there. It's not clear um sometimes it can be perplexing um sometimes it can cause us to to come up with a whole lot of questions especially since we started from such a high place right now we're like well wait a second here <laughs> this isn't what i was envisioning mm -hmm. yet we just talked about examples from i think luke and philippians of 
this is what Jesus did, so why should we think we're mm-hmm. anything, right? Well, that, that's not going to happen for us, too, right? Jesus was our perfect model. But I guess the thing that I'm trying to get to here in the Valley of the Shadow is things can get fuzzy. Things, this requires us to really hold on to what we what we've received that's right because we don't want to we don't want to let go of it Mm -hmm. here because this is not where you want to be and you don't want to get stuck here this is not the destination this is a way through yeah if you're going through hell don't stop yeah if you're catching (laughs) hell let go (laughs) that's kind of what i was yeah yeah (laughs) thank you for just saying (laughs) (laughs) right and yeah there are there i think there are things that we are we're learning here about ourselves about god about our you know this word sometimes is aggravating to me because i think it's often like fantasized our destiny right we've got these wonderful destinies and i think we do have purposes and we do have places that we're going to but destiny i think sometimes gets um exalted mm-hmm. when it shouldn't be yeah right and it's it's the journey here that's really important not just the destination mm-hmm. um and i think this is also down here in the valley where we where we should be shedding things that we don't need anymore yeah that's right yeah yeah right? i think it's often not just our destiny or our our dream or vision or purpose or calling whatever it may be that we're holding on to but i think we're, we, we carried some stuff down there some junk that we certainly don't want to have to i'm getting ready to go out to the mountains and go backpacking well i'll tell you what when you have to walk up with a load on your back you're very careful about what you put into your backpack mm-hmm. um I'm I'm weighing it, hmm. literally yeah. and figuratively. I'm weighing it. Do I need this? Do I really need this? If I had to survive without this, could I? Well, then I don't really need it mm-hmm. because everything just adds weight. And I, I will say this to you, as a backpacker, um, I I know the more stuff that I have the harder it is to go up. And it saps your strength out faster. It wears you out faster. You get a whole lot. I mean, you, you're breathing heavy. I mean, everything is costing you at that point. And you you consider, right? And so for me, do I really want to throw a can of beer in that pack? <laughs> I love my beer. <laughs> um, not really wanting to hike up thousands of feet yeah with extra weight yeah so guess what's not in my pack even though i like it it's not in my pack i'm mm-hmm. choosing to to leave that mm-hmm. because it's not really necessary um i i think that there's other things that happen in the valley i feel like i've been talking a lot so i'm gonna pause what what else happens in the valley is i guess from your experiences you really learn trust because you can't if if everything's going fine trust is an idea but you don't really learn it that's right it's not a it doesn't become a verb until you have to trust and you know really it it is the work of the holy spirit we c- we don't know those places until we're put pressed upon until mm. something circumstantial presses us in a way and God has set it up that way Mm -hmm. he needs our circumstances because they're opportunities Mm -hmm. to be pressed and to reveal the places where we are a little bit immature in our approach to something or maybe we just never maybe we've had the good life you know but what about those that have had the really bad life and they get still tested the same way it doesn't seem fair because of circumstances, but God brings things to bear in each of our hearts when you are in the midst of circumstances that you can't control, Mm -hmm. you don't know where they're going to lead, you're disappointed, all the things that are very human about us. 
And he's trying to rid that from us so our dependence is not on us but on him. And I don't know another way for him to do it because the growth is dependent upon God. And God knows what he's growing. He knows the season he wants to grow it. And he also knows us. He knows us by name. And he wants us to know him by name. And so that when we call that name, you know, we become that, you know. And so that dark dip right in there um, is the place where we really come to know him. Mm -hmm. And we can want to know him. We can have wonderful things we know about him. But trust is the bottom line to knowing God is to trust him no matter what, Mm -hmm. no matter what. I was I was listening to. Um, uh, I don't remember the name, but it was it was a blind marathon runner. Okay, so a marathon's twenty six miles, and this person finishes marathons, but they have to have somebody that runs right alongside them mm-hmm. that can see, and they have to listen to and trust that that the, the blind person has to listen to and trust their guide that's a good word their guide completely implicitly and things that we don't think about are just uneven surfaces right i mean it that matters to somebody who's i mean 26 miles i ran a marathon once and i finished it and i'm like yeah i'm not doing that again (laughs) um once was more than enough for me but it got to the point where those uneven surfaces hurt. They hurt. They. Hurt. I had to pick my legs up a little bit higher, and that hurt. And so I can't imagine doing it blind, right? I mean, the, a one rock or something in the road or a, whatever it could be, you you could stumble, and if you fell, then you're, that's kind of it, right? You, you're not necessarily got the strength to get back up. I had the strength to keep putting one foot in front of the other, and that was about it towards the end. Um, So that's kind of the way I see this valley, right? And and valley of the shadow of death makes everybody probably think of Psalm 23. Um, But that is a perfect example of what's happening, right, in that valley is – uh, Jesus is right there with us, walking us through that, leading us through that, keeping us on the path. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's where that trust, right? Because in, in, in the valley of the shadow, it, it's dark. We don't necessarily see. Mm-hmm. So that whole blind analogy kind of fits there is we have to learn to trust him to keep us on the path. It's his rod and his staff that comforts us. Right. That's from Psalm 23. Right. Well, you know, when you think about uh, that whole idea of of valley of the shadow of death, I think the real key there is thou art with me. Mm -hmm. Is are we really learning the thou art with me, no matter whatever it is we may go through, whether we feel and I think that's the thing is you start at a high point many times and everything's going wonderful with God and, 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 and everything's great. And then all of a sudden, it's like I don't sense his presence anymore. I don't know where God is. I don't know what's happening. Is is always trusting in thou art with me because right. I think it's in that place that we mature to the degree that we walk by faith. We that's walk right. by knowing that he's living in me, he didn't go anywhere, and this is just a time where I can't see one inch out in front of me. I just have to trust that each step I'm taking, he's guiding me through this. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, he's perfecting the faith that's within us. He's maturing the faith that's within. He's cultivating something of a high value. Peter says that. Mm -hmm. Um, It's more precious than gold. And also it's going to provide what is needed for him to restore and to redeem so many other things because this treasure is in earthen vessels. Mm -hmm. It's in the seed that's within us, you know, so that perfecting is um, the process of 
of just getting to the bottom line. He is with me. He is my God. I mean, those bottom lines are critical in this deep, deep part right here. Mm -hmm. And that, that knowing, that knowing that he's with you, that the covenant is strong enough to hold him, no matter what you've done right or done wrong. It's mm -hmm. not about that at that point. But you get down here, that means that the, the strength from within with our faith is as strong as the pressure outside of us mm -hmm. to not believe. And he's trusting us at that point that we'll show it forth by leaning and trusting and believing him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now we start to come out. We've kind of talked about this already, but then we start to hit the resurrection. So to me, if we're back to that seed metaphor, I, that's when the seed, now, now the pressure that you just spoke of, Carol, it, it's cracked open the, mm -hmm. the dead hole, mm -hmm. right? That's, that that shell that it's gonna be gone now it's being left behind and what's now happening is the new growth starts to to root and take hold and something new then works its way out of the soil and starts honestly reaching upward um that's to me that's when that's when the, the death part is now completed and the resurrection part has now begun. You know, interesting. Whenever you plant a seed, and this, we do this at Pilot Farm. This is what we do. We, we plant a lot of things. When you put that seed in the ground, it first has to break out of its own shell, and it's still in the dark. Mm -hmm. It's still under the soil. And once it breaks its own shell, then it starts to come up through the dirt, and then it breaks through to the light. And a lot of times, breaking out of your own shell, you're, it's in the process of resurrection. You're in the process upward, but it doesn't. it's still dark. Yeah. You still have a lot of unanswered things about what, what is all this down here about, you know. And yet, when it breaks open the ground, it's actually the second breaking out that has happened before it hits the sunlight. Oh, and like and now— you begin to see evidence, mm -hmm. evidence of what this was all about. Mm -hmm. First mm -hmm. blade, first mm -hmm. blade. Yeah, I like mm -hmm. that. I like that. The second breaking out. I like that. It does. It breaks out of the shell, and then it breaks out of the dirt. Yeah, mm -hmm. I like that. Mm -hmm. Into the light. Then the next step along this process is when we bump into our giants. Mm. Yeah, I think God... God, in our immature state, does not take us into the promised land in that context. In our immature state, he doesn't, listen, we're in the promised land when we get saved. Don't get me wrong. We become believers. Jesus walks in our life. We're in heaven, basically, or heaven's in us. But I think that before God has us face uh, something very huge is we we have to have this valley of the shadow where we learn trust and humility in order to be able to face this huge mm -hmm. thing that, that, that comes and hits us in the face. And that's what takes maturity is to be able to face these giants. Because see, what, what happened? The Israelites went through all the wilderness. They did all of that they did going through. During that time, if you remember, Caleb was 40 years old. Joshua was about the same year, same age. And they were young men. By the time they got ready to go into the land, it said that Caleb was as strong, if not stronger, than he was when he was 40. And that was when he was 80. Isn't that interesting? So it's like God took them through all of that wilderness experience. But what did they have to go fight? No, they didn't just walk into the promised land and, oh, everything's cool. They had to fight giants. And... And I, I'm going to add into your story that Caleb didn't just want to go fight the giants. He wanted to fight the the biggest of them all. Yeah. That was his. Yeah. He, he, had, he stuck a claim. He's like, I want that really big guy right there, <laughs> the father of the giants. Yeah. I'm going after him. Mm -hmm. He's mine. That's mine. And he could do that by faith because cause he started his journey. He was in the va he was in the wilderness. Joshua was in the wilderness. And in those places, even though they went out and spied and came back, they clung to what they believed about God. 
and they clung to it till they finally went into the promised land. They yeah. never let that go. I've never thought about this, but he was ready to go get that big guy at 40 years old. Mm-hmm. Yes, he and was. then he waited another 40 years, so a whole nother lifetime from when he was ready before. Mm-hmm. And he's by that time, I'm sure the anticipation was, no, 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 that one's mine. Yeah. I, I, I was ready 40 years ago for that guy. He's mine now. <laughs> And, you know, that interim there is really when he helped others come into their land, to their inheritance for what was designated for them. He was willing to wait, and that's maturity right there as well for all of us that, you know, it's not our faith alone, um, but there are many things that, um, you know, we're called to possess and overcome Mm -hmm. that others are going to have to help. We're going to have to help them. Yeah, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hate that four-letter word. (laughs) Wait. I thought you meant help. <laughs> <laughs> no, help, help. I don't want to help others. <laughs> no, no. One of the things I like, I, I don't know where it is in the Bible. I was just looking for it. But um, when the Israelites finally go into the land, God doesn't drive all the people out because, well, until they were going to be big enough. But also he wanted the younger generations to be able to learn war. That's right. I remember reading that and being like, interesting interesting he kept he let there be still some things they would have to persevere so the younger generations would learn war that's right yeah he wanted to teach them Mm -hmm. and not just i mean the the, the caleb generation he was ready right but then all the rest of them yeah i like that that's a good point then then right we just we kind of went there we're talking about fulfillment, right? They they start to they start to occupy that place that they that they saw long ago, right? But now instead of being at a place where they were maybe not mature enough, they've had that opportunity now to 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 become, to to grow, to to be able to occupy that place. You know, I mean, this, it, there's maturity at two levels there. One is personal, but then the other is what God is doing with the church. Mm. You right. know, we have a corporate maturity that is right along with the personal maturity mm. that we might gain mm. as leaders or as brothers or sisters. And, you know, only God can gauge how to bring those things and reconcile that so they work together and not against each other. Uh, I think when you're talking about Caleb, I think of what it took for him to wait because he was passionate. And he said, I want that heel right there. That's mine for sure. Um, But there were, I mean, the waiting that was involved from the personal place to lay that aside, I think that's where you learn that on the way up as well. Because once you, you know these things and you get to a place and you go, oh, it's a little longer. I thought it would be now, you know. Uh, but to reach the fulfillment for any of us, we have to consider the corporate as well as the personal maturity or the personal trail that we're blazing or we're passing through or whatever. Um, the same way you would have to do one person in a family. You know, God is bringing us all together here. Well, that's the whole that's the whole idea that we've been talking about in maturity, right? Is it's not just self centered, mm-hmm. right? It's others focused and making sure that mm-hmm. in making sure that you can occupy you can take it but can you occupy it yeah. can you keep it can, can you, steward you establish it, it? Steward can you it. grow it can you persevere mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well you know paul when he was writing his letters always wrote it to you plural it was right. not written to us singularly yeah mm-hmm. it was always written written to a community and what happens in the community? Then, of course, he would have understood that, having come out of, uh, uh, you know, his own Jewish community and what they understood about community, that everything affected community. He would have been emphasizing that same sense in his letters too. That's how you know your doctrine is correct. Is how you interact with your community. That's how, right. If you love others, if you, otherwise you can have all the correct ideas and doctrine and understandings but if you don't love others it's just whatever it's, it's not community yeah it really is then it's just yeah. um we're all on the bus going somewhere but yeah community is a living expression 
of how our lives interact together to bring something together uh, for the benefit of everybody with all those differences, Mm -hmm. with all those different aspects. Mm -hmm. That's true community. I remember the old hymn, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah. Our. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's our Father in heaven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, (laughs) when I think about, too, when I think about all of this, when I think about Ephesians 4, where it talks a lot about all this community and coming, you know, to where all all built up and so forth, is it talks about equipping. And the purpose in the fivefold ministry is not to go out there and be recognized as, oh, I'm an apostle, I'm this, I'm blah, blah, blah. No, their whole purpose was to equip the saints for the what? Work of service. Mm -hmm. That's the whole point in, in those ministries. It was to serve to that degree. And I think of it in the sense of mentors and people that, that help guide you and help you through some of these values and to let you know, oh, this is normal. You're okay. Um, God's just trying to teach you some stuff here. You're okay. You, you know, you know that, that's always comforting. And I've had mentors in my life that, that just bless the, my socks off in that context. They always, you know. I remember when, matter of fact, Sheila and I were first married. We were fighting like cats and dogs. I know none of y'all have ever had that problem, but never. Um, we uh, so we we finally went to see someone that we loved and trusted, and, and shared our stuff. And he just looked at us and laughed and says, "That's yeah, nothing. You just blah blah blah." And we kind of walked away from there, going, "Oh, you know, it was like that was silly." <laughs> you know, because it was it was no, we were just making, and he said, oh, you know, basically what he was saying was not. I mean, he talked us through stuff and all, but when we walked away from it, it was like, oh gosh, <laughs> till the next time, you know. But anyway, that was that was kind of the sense. He kind of helped us through that what we thought was a oh my god horrible dark time, you know, yeah, yeah. we were going through, mm-hmm. and it really wasn't. In retrospect, isn't it all kind of silly? <laughs> Not worth comparing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you know, there's one other thing um, that you just you triggered, David, with um, the thought of what are the things that God uses to mature us, and then you can think of the church's function within fivefold or within equipping, and those are administrative things that are meant to mature us as well, as far as Um, the action of service or whatever. But the thing that I think uh, we're going to really come into a greater clarity and um, a new strength of focus on is that there have to be mothers and fathers in the faith Yes. that mature us relationally. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because everything is set up within a family unit, um, and it's meant to be the strength of where these other things rest. It is the foundation, if you will, because it was the relationship of Jesus with his father that sustained the ministry that he did. And it actually supported the death and resurrection. And um, for him to go down into this place and confront death for us, it was the relationship that he had with his father that sustained him in the garden so that he could endure the next day and then hang up there six hours or whatever. And there's something of the relationship of mothers and fathers that bring that kind of support to the church Mm -hmm. and to those that are going through those places. And um, there's nothing like being near mama or being like near daddy when you're in these places where the soul is just pressed on really, really strong. And I think it's both those things together that should be functioning toward bringing the seed of Jesus Christ to a point of maturity. I'm reminded of this week, this past week, when the submarine yeah. imploded. And the bottom line of that is the pressure without was greater than the pressure within. Mm-hmm. And it couldn't sustain the depth. Right. This is a deep place right here. Uh, but if we are uh, matured properly, the, the word promises us that the depth, the height, the length, and the breadth, if we'll just mature, when we get in mm-hmm. that we will be sustained from within that will stand up against any outside pressure whatsoever. And isn't that what he's after in the earth? Mm -hmm. Is that there would be a glory to this process. Mm -hmm. 
that would be not just for our freedom, but it would be for the glory of Jesus Christ in that body. Yeah. Right. The, the body in the earth, we can't imagine what that glory is going to be about. But this process right here with this chart, if you will have to follow him in it. We follow in his footsteps. He sh he's already carved it for us. Mm -hmm. He's already broken it up for us. Mm -hmm. The victory is set. There's nothing to be added to that. It's just who will follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And humility, of course, is the is the fertilizer that will mm. that will really break the seed and cause us to walk into resurrection. Let's bless the listeners. Father, I ask that you bless all those listening, that they to be encouraged for them not to not to have fear, but to have courage. Bless them with Caleb's courage. Bless them with Caleb's vision and understanding and knowledge to know that you're with them. I bless them with the, the strength to withhold inside the outside pressure. And I bless them with the victory that's, that's imminent mm -hmm. in Jesus' mm -hmm. name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>